okay, and we're live for episode 9 of Our Time Is Now. Ladies and gentlemen, I got a homeboy coming on the show today. One of my childhood friends go by the name of Tree J, a.k.a. TJ the Road Star Roden. That's the nickname I gave him back in the day. And here we are for Our Time Is Now, episode 9 for the first official Wrestling With Time, WWT, episode one. And the only way to get that started off right is with a little bit of bang, bang. I'm on my Cactus Jack. You know what I'm saying? And today's show is sponsored to you by El Segundo, Steve Austin's Broken Skull IPA. Now give me a hell yeah, and there's only one way you can set off a podcast of wrestling without mentioning the GOAT. Stone Cold Steve Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. Let me tell you, I've been looking for these everywhere. I ain't found them. They come in a four pack at the local beverage barn. Beer distributor where I'm at, it was $14 for a four pack, but you bet your sweet ass I had to pick some up. Support my man, the Texas Rattlesnake himself. And yeah, you know, I wish I could just crack these two goddamn beer cans together and give me a beer bash, but I'm at my grandma's crib and I can't have a mess. So, yeah. And also, got on my little Razor Ramon flow, like episode one, keep the curls going. About to give my boy... Tree J, a.k.a. The Road Star Road in a call. We better jump into it. This week, what we are discussing is WWE, well, WWF, whatever, WCW Invasion 2001, the turning point where the industry was monopolized by no other than Vincent Kennedy McMahon himself. So, if you got a pair of grapefruits, Austin, get out here right now and give me a goddamn stutter, will ya? I don't need the Austin who gives me hugs. No. <laughs> but yo, we about to get into it. I'm goofing off. I'm in rare form today. Y'all are seeing me in rare form. So let's get to it. We about to make things happen. Calling up my man right now. Got a couple notes we're going to go over. And we also going to discuss the late, great Eddie Van Halen. His impact on the industry. This is my homeboy TJ's favorite artist. We gonna jump into it. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. In this corner, weighing in at 195 pounds, he is from Long Island, New York, now hailing from Ithaca, New York, he is making his return to Earth from the hyperbolic time chamber. The challenger, Time War. Always wrestling with time. However, from here on and forever, our time is now. Yo, yo, yo. Hey, what is going on there, Ty? How My you doing? Guy. What's happening, Mr. I said, yo, Tree J Roden, a.k.a. Roadstar Roden. Um, I, in, professional-wise, I like to be called Roadstar because that used to be the wrestling name Doug, back in the day. Doug, I was saying, I, get, uh, I think I gave you that name on the block, like 2000. You did back fucking like, 10. right around like. Yeah, 2010, right around your birthdays when you came up with that name. The crutches? The birthday and I was on crutches? Is... Yeah. I still got that photo. I'm going to post that shit. Oh, you damn right. I still have that photo. I post it every year around your birthday. It's good every times. year in August, I'll usually post it. It's good days. I'm, I'm, I got my dirty sock on the crutches. People are like, yo, why ain't you got a fucking shoe on? I'm like, because I was on crutches and my foot was swollen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was bad. It was bad that year. Yo, my guy, I'm setting it off the only way I know possible. I would be having a beer bash for Austin 316, but I got the Steve El Segundo Broken Skull IPA. Wow, how is it? I'm not a. It's going to shock a lot of people and probably you because times have changed. I don't drink no more. So, every once in a blue moon, I would drink, but 
I'm not a big drinker. TJ, it does not shock me. I don't know if you know, but like a couple weekends ago, I fell off the wagon on my sister's birthday and I got really reckless. And it's crazy because today I planned this podcast. I had this all ready. So I'm drinking these in exception. But I was digging through my grandma's stuff because we're having a yard sale at her house this weekend. I came across this one day at a time, Al Anon, bro. And I think this is my father's AA book because in it, he has this letter from 1987, bro. And it says, To mom and dad, I'm trying wow. to straighten my life out. Finally, I'm glad my whole family is behind me. Please read this if you can. It will help you cope better. I love you both always, Ziggy. And the only thing, I, I, Al Anon, I haven't heard it called that, but I'm guessing AA, you know, Al Anon, it's got to be. And I was like, maybe this is my wake up call to get my life back on track. But I said, today's an exception, but I'm the same boat, brother. I don't drink no more. I don't get shit faced where I wake up on my neighbor's lawn, ass naked, running around mastic in my underwear. <laughs> I, 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 what, what turned me off from drinking was your 19th party when we were all hanging out and I was going through a difficult time. I, I was doing a little bit of drugs and I, I, I remember drinking four, four locos, smoking locos. a shit ton of pot. Locos. Yeah, the, the original Locos, the yeah. original where they were actually tasted good, not where they taste like shit. Well, they, they always tasted like shit. It was a matter of the shit in it made your heart jump beats, bro. Oh, yeah. You know? I remember I remember taking like four or five Percocets, smoking a whole bunch of weed, <sighs> and drinking four of those, and I ended up sleeping on Kyle's lawn. Yeah. Yo, bro, I remember the night and very you vague. you all thought I was dead. Very vague. I remember like jumping on top of Matt Willensy's car at Mobile doing the Limb Biscuit rolling dance and I dented yeah. the roof of his car. I was like rolling, rolling, it, rolling. It was you, me, Matt Wilinski, and your cousin Eric. Matt took us up to the Mobile to go get the, all those fucking four locos and beers. <laughs> Yo, dude, it was it, the the times of the days. I, I was thinking about it the other day. I remember like chilling in your basement. We used to play like fucking SmackDown vs. Raw, whatever it was for Xbox. Like just come down the steps, bro. Everybody just like smoking some weed, playing with your fucking snakes. You had like fucking uh, ball pythons, right? Yeah, my mom so, still has all the fucking really? snakes to this day. Still the same yeah, ones? Same my snakes? mom also, same snakes. Yeah, reptiles not, last long. Snakes, Snakes can live up to probably anywhere between forty to seventy years. They really don't have a good eye well, time rep of it reptiles of, in general, bro. It, well, think of this: a turtle, a regular box hundred, turtle that you can years get at the old. lake, can live almost a regular box turtle can live up to eighty to a hundred years. Fucking insane, bro! Imagine being that slow that, your and, whole and, life. And that's and and that's a little box turtle only gets this big. Yeah, ma imagine being that slow your whole life though. You got to cross the street. You're like, I'm coming back with my lettuce in my mouth. Damn right. Just like it takes you, you like, fucking I'm, fifty I'm years to get from Ronkonkoma to I, Mastic. You see, like I'm one of those people. If I see the turtle in the road, I'm going to stop traffic and I'm going to put it to the yeah. other side because I've of seen do. too many turtles getting. Even snapper turtles. I've seen people help snapper turtles. Oh yeah. All you got to do is nudge them from already. behind. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what, what I've heard. <laughs> but uh, what I really wanted to get into here, man, is uh, when you recently hit me up about this, I know that recently your favorite, you know, musician of all time probably passed away, Eddie Van Halen, the late great. And uh, you were like, bro, we got to do a podcast. And I said, why? And you were like, Eddie Van Halen just passed away. And I remember back in the day, I stole your greatest hits album. I think you had the volume one and volume two. Like you left them in my car one day and I had those shits for like fucking four years later, bro. Probably yeah, until I moved upstate. volume one tattoo. Till, uh, probably. Oh, you just, that's what you're getting right now? No, I, I've, I've had this since I was 18. It's faded over the past 10 years. What the fuck? No, it hasn't yep. faded that much, right? I remember when you got that. Who did it though? My mom's boyfriend's daughter gave oh, it to me okay, for my 19th yeah. birthday. I remember. Sherry, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. She pops up in my time hop every now and then. It's about the same times when we was all chilling at the crib back in the day. The wild posts, yep. like, come through, party on the block. Bro, we had a lot of parties on the block. There was a, a lot, lot of, parties. of parties on the block. And, uh, yeah, man. But, I, like I said, I remember when you gave me the uh, the CDs and... I was bumping him forever, and I knew who Eddie Van Halen was, but I was never really put on. Like, when you gave me those CDs and I listened to the greatest hits, one, I was like, damn, every song this guy did was greatest hits. You got two volumes of greatest hits. They're all hits. And yeah, Every uh, single one. 
He's not for oh, everybody, no, but just the even the, the ones that they my on favorite, the radio. my favorite, since we're a wrestling podcast, ready to rumble, run it with the devil and fucking David That's Arquette and uh, Sean, I forget his name. They're, they're fucking singing with the nuns in the, in the minivan on the way to visit Sal Bandini or some shit. Sal Bandini, you want to wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to throw a couple of facts at you because not a lot of people know this. I watched a video from Gene Simmons from back from 1985. Okay. When Van Halen just broke up and they just got together with Sammy Hagar or when Sammy Hagar just did his first solo album, Can't Drive 55. Yeah. Gene Simmons and Ace Frehley from Kiss were the ones who founded Van Halen. They were in a bar in Burbank in 1976, and they were there talking to some dude from a, from a record company, and Van Halen was playing on stage because it was one of those karaoke nights. So at the end of their first song, Gene asked them to talk with them. Ever since then, that's when Van Halen was thrown into the public. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Kiss, fa Kiss found Van Halen. Van Halen wasn't found by a record company. They were founded by the legendary band Kiss. I, I had no idea. I don't, and my, my friend Nico, I don't know if you ever met my friend Nico from, that I grew up in elementary school with, and uh, his, his dad was a huge Kiss fan, like Kiss memorabilia. He was a drummer, loved Kiss. And uh, I actually wound up going to one of Kiss's tours with my boy Steve, and it was, I think, Kiss and Motley Crue one year. And uh, it was at Jones Beach 2012. Was it Motley Crue? I think it was Motley Crue. And, uh, it was that probably fucking... during Motley Crue's last couple Bro, of runs. Yeah, and it, 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 I saw Motley Crue twice. I saw them with Poison, Motley Crue and Never Poison. Never got to see him. And I saw, I saw them with Kiss. And at Jones Beach, it was like it started to rain towards the end of the show. And, of course, they're doing rock and roll all night. And they're like... You think we're going to stop here? We're going to run it back one more time. And they did the whole song. And then they did the rock and roll all night, like the hook for 10 minutes straight while it's downpouring rain. Either you're sipping your <laughs> beer and you're chilling in your poncho or you're leaving Jones Beach to get to your car and be like, oh, my God, I can't rock and roll all night. <laughs> like, uh, how, how about the Super Bowl when Prince played? I don't I, don't, I haven't watched football in so long, bro. I don't that, even uh, that was a couple. Uh, that was a year or two. I, I think before I was so drunk Wait, during did... every Super Bowl, dude. I don't remember any of them except Janet Jackson's tits in fourth grade before I drank. Hey, J hey, Justin Timberlake got to grab him first. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. JT, man, I'm hating on you, brother. <laughs> so, um, uh, what was I gonna say? Um, talking about kissing. Prince. Oh, Prince. Prince. Prince back uh, did the Super Bowl a few years ago, and when he did the Super Bowl, it started to rain, and he ended up doing his song "Purple, Purple rain. rain" in the rain. Brilliant in the rain, and it was so cool that it, he they had the stage all LED'd out in purple, so as even the stadium up above, as it's raining, you're seeing purple rain <sighs> come down with the rain in now it. So that, the lights has the water stroll yeah, reflecting. So it's an actual authentic authentic feeling of the song. I'm going to have to Google because it. Because Purple Rain was created for the movie that he did, Purple Rain. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if you're noticing, I'm rocking my Bang Bang Cactus Jack. And it's also the uh, anniversary edition to Ashley Massaro. Yes, it and is. This was the one that... Fellow Mick, Long Islander. Yeah, Mick Foley put it up on Twitter, and it was, like, helping the, all the proceeds get a, get a, got an autograph. I got an autograph card from him, and all the proceeds helped her go to college, her daughter's college funds, tuition, and stuff for the future. God, God rest her soul, but that was crazy yeah. news because I remember when she was from Long Island, she was doing the diva search back in the day, and she threw her phone number on TV, and it was, like, 516 area 2003, code. 2003, 2004. Bro. I was, uh, so I was 12, 13 years old. I'm like writing that shit down. Like, yo, I got to call her, right? But you know how busy that damn hotline was if it was her real phone, bro? <laughs> well, a little uh. secret. During 2002 to 2003, I wasn't a big wrestling fan. I kind of got out of it. Bro, I mean, we both phased I, out of it. Me and you were always on the old shit. You know, like we, we did, I go we did to get my out of it. Aunt. I go to my aunt's one year for Christmas. 
Guess who is the next door neighbor? And who? they lived in Selden. Who? Ashley Massaro. No shit. That's dope. No shit. I got to meet her before she was even in the WWE. Yeah, before the diva search type shit. She she used to babysit my cousin. <sighs> cool shit. Yeah. And since you have, and since you mentioned McFoley, I myself. Bang bang. Three faces of Foley. Three faces of Foley. Know it. And if and if you check out my Facebook profile, Tree J Roden. You can go through my profile pictures, and you can see me inside of Mick Foley's house because I used to work on his house. Excuse me. I think I remember you told me that. You know who else had a story like that? Mick Foley was such a great guy because Dave Stretz, bro, when he had, like, that tumor on his neck, we were in, like, middle school or high school. It might have been seventh, eighth grade, but Dave, you know Dave Stretz, right? No. You remember Greg Cabela? Castro? Mm -hmm. Well, Greg, Dave yeah. was Dave was friends with them. If you see his face, you might remember, but he had a tumor. He was out of school a lot. I went to elementary school with him, so I know, but like in seventh grade, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, like he was out of school a lot because he had this big growth here. He was in the hospital and Mick Foley happened to be in the hospital, like visiting, I think his son or somebody for something going that day. So he visited Dave in his hotel room, in, in his uh, hospital room. And Dave was talking to him. Dave actually got to go over and hang out with his son, Dewey. Like, he's got pictures, like, chilling on his couch. I wound up meeting Mick Foley at an ROH event at Sports Plus about a year into Dave's treatment. Like, him and Dave were cool at this point already. And I met Mick Foley. I got his autograph, and I got pictures with him. And I was like, do you know Dave Stretz? And he goes, yeah, I'm actually going to a book signing in Riverhead shortly after this, and Dave's going to meet me there. And I thought that was cool as shit. I'm like, yo, here's a dude that Dave met in the hospital, and you built this relationship with this outstanding guy. Read Have a Nice Day, his book. I just started reading it. Like, I didn't realize he went to Cortland. Like, he was going to Binghamton. That's up by me, bro. I'm by Ithaca. Like, he was mm -hmm. bussing up. Like, stand-up dude, Mick Foley, bro. There's one of a kind that come he, along he, in a lifetime. He is one of the, being working for him in his house and actually getting to know him for over three and a half years, he is probably one of the nicest guys you will ever meet. In the 100%. wrestling business, he does he, he doesn't curse. He doesn't. He, I, I'm I'm being honest with you. Here, you here here's here's hear where you're gonna you know you know how you're gonna hate him now. Ag agree to disagree. He does send a lot of messages towards your boy Trump though, and I know you're a fucking Trump trained fucking oh, fanatic. Oh well, <laughs> you, you know personal opinion when it comes to politics. I'm not a that. big politic guy. I you know me personally. If you're my friend, you're Democrat. Your view is your view. That's I how like it should Tom be, Trump bro. That's guy. how it. That's that's where the fucking world is going wrong. Is they want to live in a non-binary society when everything is left, right, Republican, Democrat, love, hate, yeah, hot or not, hot or flop, whatever. I'm, like, I, I'm, I, we're Americans. That's it, bro. American. Can. I can we're if Americans. we're together, united. You know what I mean? Exactly. But uh, I, yeah, I agree with you no on that 100%. This side should be fighting with this side. They, 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 you know, Bro, they, I, I've just always said this should... Independent party. You can't go left and you can't go right. You got to go right up the fucking middle, make your own path, come together, shake hands, agree to disagree, figure out what you're going to work out instead of spreading the hate over bullshit because by spreading hate and ending relationships with people over something silly without any proof of anything to back it up or back up your, your uh, convictions like... What are you going to do, bro? You're going to accuse Every, people of something and not even know the truth or not because it makes it gets you the attention. It, it brings you into the spotlight, makes you look like a good person. You're holier than thou. Fuck out of here, bro. We're all no, we're all people. I, we need I, to I work together. You, Community support, is the most important thing, pillar in the world. I support what I support, and that's it. Everybody has their views. As that's long it. as you can get along, y'all can get along. I hear you. I'm just messing with you because I did see him post. <laughs> he posts a lot of Mr. President things, and I'm like... But it's dope, bro, that you that you could build a relationship I, with this guy. You know, like, you, you have no idea. My car, I own 20 Trump flags. I drive around all day in Long Island with my Trump flags hanging out of my car. Uh, I, you know, me I personally, I, I see you. I, I like, I, I like it. You got the power and tie shirt on. I, it <laughs> oh, Lord. We are hashtagging that, and we are going to get views, ladies and gentlemen. You could, you could, you could get on your hate uh, speech wave if you want. It's Tree J Roden at Twitter. <laughs> actually, 
My Twitter account just got banned the other day for calling Chris, Chris Cuomo of CNN fucking Frito. Oh, Lord. What, what is your Twitter? I didn't even know you fucking had a Twitter. My Twitter is at Roden Timothy. All right. And the actual name is uh, and the actual name is L.I. Trump edition. Time for you to make a new Twitter. Well, I'm banned for the next six days. Here, here's what I don't get, though. Here's what I hate <laughs> is the fact that. Uh, the world with politics is that like the rappers used to be cool with Trump and it wasn't until he was president that the media was able to shift his, uh, the hatred towards him, right? And even I think some of the rappers started to believe the fallacies and be like, well, fuck Trump anyway because it's the cool thing to do. When in reality, Joe Biden said a shitload of racist shit in the past and people are like, oh, well, now he's cool because they say he's cool. And it's like, okay, well, Trump's racist and Joe Biden's racist, but you're like, well, I'm going to take this racist over this racist. That makes fucking sense. Like, if you're going to hate both motherfuckers for being racist, you hate them both. Well, it, it, a tiger, a, a, a tiger between... doesn't change his stripes. You know what I mean? Like, if you're a racist, you're probably a racist for life. Unless you get older and you exactly. get to a stage of regret. But you usually don't wind up cool and then go racist later in life. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. It doesn't work. Like, I'm friends with everybody. Now I hate everybody. It's usually I hate everybody and I pretend to love everybody, but I still hate everybody. You know, like... Whatever, but that's just my logic. But what the fuck do I know? I'm just a podcast and rap and talk and shit, smacking, fucking, don't even know what I'm going to say next. It's just fucking diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just coming out, bro. That's All it. Right, bro. Bro, like your boy fucking uh, Long Island Iced Vin, Z. Vin, Vinny Russo. Oh. No, no, Vinny Russo. Vinny Russo, who sits in Denver, Cal in Denver California. Uh, California. Colorado. Who the fuck is Vin, smoke his weed. Who the fuck is Vinny Russo? Vinci oh, Russo. Vinci Russo. Yeah, yeah. Fuck that guy, bro. I hate that guy. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest liars in the professional wrestling business. But you know who I really he, hate, bro? I appreciate his art. Credit. He takes the credit for the Montreal screw job, which oh, really? we now know. Which we now know because of Vice lands beyond, the, you know, the dark side. Dark of the Dark side ring. of the ring. Yeah. We, which we finally know that it was Jim Cornette's idea for the Montreal screw job. Which brings me my, to my next show. thing. I hate that motherfucker too, bro. I, I love his work. He's just I, annoying. I, I love Jim. Annoying. I love Jim as a manager Genius. and as a wrestling talent. Genius. Genius. As a person, annoying as, a person, as he's fuck. He's a little screwed up. I've heard I just yes. heard his promos and I'm just like, shut up, Jim. But then I've heard promos. That I'm like, all right, you go, Jim. But I'm just like, it's like a love-hate. Like, I love Jim Cornette. He is you a genius. I will never take away stuff? his ability to run a show and do what he's got to do to make things happen. But when I when I see him give promos sometimes, I'm like, I just want to punch you in the face. <laughs> you want to see his best stuff, go to WWE's network and look up Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I watched it. And look at and look Bro. at the ones where he is New Jack's manager. Manager. New Jack New is Jack. crazy. New Jack was Crazy one of the most of controversial wrestlers ever in existence, only for the fact that he actually took racism to a different level. He, he, he bought it into the industry the and ran on it. Yeah. He, he used the N word in the industry. He used the white boy versus the black boy racism yep. on there. And I, 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 I can tell you one promo off the top of my head that he did. He was facing the Rock and Roll Express in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And Smoky, and he comes down and says that, you know, the Rock and Roll Express, you know, calling us some chicken seed, homegrown seed spitting N words. We're like, no. It was like, he, he had a bag of cotton while he was doing the promo. He sat there and he goes, and we don't pick cotton. He threw the cotton up in the air. And his, ta his tag team partner picked it up and started dying laughing in the middle of the ring. Started blowing it all over the place. He so he doesn't get enough credit for racism. what he's done in the industry, bro. And I I watched the dark side of the ring with no. him, and he's a crazy son of a bitch. But at the same time, it's what brings he, the views in, and he's basing it on reality. Because as much as we want to think it doesn't happen in the world, Jack, it's been there, dude. It's been there. It's been in history, written and erased. He told New Jack when he went out there for his first promo, he said, we're in the South. They don't like black people. Use that to your advantage. He became one of the most hated black people wrestlers in the Pe South. There was people that wanted to murder him, bro. 
all the way up until ECW where he was able to take his talent to ECW and turn that New Jack character even more crazier. Bro, people wanted to really him. lynch him, bro. There was like real fans who yes. would like wait outside venues to like try to lynch dude, I'm sure, you know, like. Yes. I think that's hey, what Jim they were saying in Dark Side of the Ring was it got violent some nights, bro, with him there because of the, 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 Jim the shit Cornette he stirred said up. on one of his stories, on one of his podcasts, he told he he told a story that the same story with New Jack and the Rock and Roll Express, when the Rock and Roll Express and and they were leaving, the crowd was so bad outside of the stadium that the Rock and Roll Express actually held almost had to plow through the crowd to let New Jack and his get partner through. get into their car and leave. Yeah. That's but how bad it was. The thing about it, dude, what I love about wrestlers, and I mean, remember when we were growing up, like, we got a lot of hate for watching wrestling. Excuse me? I don't know if you remember elementary school, but, like, kids used to watch basketball and football. If, if, back, back then, if you watched wrestling, you were a nerd. But here's the thing. The Those were the best days of wrestling. Now wrestling became yes. World Wrestling Entertainment, PG, and people who used to make fun of me back then watch it now, and I'm like... You are missing out. You're watching some bullshit. Roman Reigns, The Rock's cousin, do a Superman punch. You don't oh. remember the fucking <laughs> none of the DX, like, suck it, the butt chops, the bra and panties matches, all the shit that fucking they used to do back That's in the day, funny bro. funny how you say bra and panties match because today's topic is, there is a bra and panties match. Bro, yo, let's, let's kind of let's start to segue into that because... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna discuss. I think that was a perfect segue. I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned on the uh, introduction that we were going to be discussing the 2001 invasion. And when I contacted you the other day at the park, I said, "Yo, I want to do invasion." And the reason why is because we're at this turning point in wrestling history again, where it used to be WCW versus WWE, the Monday Night Wars for supremacy. And yep. Vince McMahon came and crushed, and he conquered, and he took WCW and ran it into the ground. I took WCW. Squeezed the life out of him, yeah. and I just fucked him with my fist. It, it, <laughs> but uh, what he, not a lot of people know is after Vince took over, all these independent wrestling promotions started becoming a lot bigger. So one of the biggest ones that I'm going to bring up is from a former, is actually a WWE Hall of Famer as of right now, and former backstage, and actually current backstage producer, Jeff Jarrett. Legend, when, Tennessee. When Vince McMahon bought WCW, he fired Jeff Jarrett live on television. We all saw that. He, he said J-E-F-F-J-E-R-T-T is G-O-N-N-E. Really? Is, he's gone. Yes. Okay, I didn't know. So a year later, I was kind of wondering where he went. Jeff Jarrett, he did the TNA. Jeff Jarrett and his father created TNA, which is technically, and it's still now it's considered Impact Wrestling. Yeah, I've now because now it's owned by Sammy Callahan and Doug. I, I watch it for free sometimes on Pluto TV. Axios TV on if you have cable. Axios. I do Pluto on my phone. It's got like channels, old Nicktoons, fucking cartoons, Dexter's Laboratory yeah. and shit. Like, but yeah, TNA. So. Um, that's where all the older stars started to go. And that's where WWE started creating newer stars. Um, well, you're right. Cause Sting but, went, Flair went, Hogan went, Angle went. Yep. I mean, Everybody the top went. talent, which, which is crazy because like Vince was kind of getting a monopoly on the industry at this point. Like TNA did break that's through, but why when, T it, when TNA got their first pay-per-view in 2003, it started their, their, their world heavyweight championship match was a former WWE talent known as K-Quick, who is now today our truth He was always K-Quick, though, in WWE, too. He was getting yep. rowdy. Yep. Do he, moves, when dead, he came rowdy. back in 08. Oh, now dirty ass sleeves in. He suck it down. When he came back in 08, he came under the name of our truth Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, in TNA, he changed his name to Ron the Truth Killing. Yeah, yeah, Ron Killings. Well, I he think that was the first WWE superstar to become a TNA world champion. Which pisses Besides me off that Jeff it took. Jarrett. Which pisses me off that it took so long for him to get over because that dude is one of the top talents that WWE has today, especially with the twenty four seven title. I don't know if he's still doing that. I haven't watched it in a while, but. He's still doing that, and he's he's the most entertaining draw they have. So they should have put that guy over a long time ago, and he's been busting his ass for at least, I know, 15, maybe close to 20 years in this industry. I don't know. I remember watching him, like, early days, though. Like you said, K-Quick, when he was first coming out, bro. 
before R Truth, before Ron Killings, before time. TNA. Like he, when he was with WWE the first time, he yep. used to come out rapping his theme. Like around the same era when John Cena was probably Doctor of Thugonomics. They were trying to do I that hip hop thing. At that time, he was already in TNA when John oh, Cena really? became the Doctor. So, of so he was already yeah. he was pr prior to them. Then even he was prior to John. Yeah, John Cena debuted June twenty seventh, two thousand and one. And he debuted under uh, against Kurt Angle. Regular, with, uh, regular. He just, I'm aggression. John Cena, ruthless aggression. Ruthless. Oh. And smack yeah. Kurt Angle in the face. Yeah. But, it uh, wasn't until 2003 after he faced the, uh, after that one match he had for the United States Championship at the end of SmackDown, Wrestle the Undertaker comes and shakes his hand. Wasn't it WrestleMania at 20 when he won the U.S. title, though? I thought he won a, a big show at, at WrestleMania 20. No, it was before that because he still had the original gear on. Oh, maybe maybe he was maybe he was retaining the title for the U.S. title at, at WrestleMania. Probably. Or no, no, I think Big it's, Show was the champ, and then John Cena took. It, 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 I forget. It's been it's been a while unless I go back and watch. I remember like watching it jumping on my couch when John Cena won because I was in seventh grade and he was my favorite. And Undertaker made his return after being buried alive by Kane that year. And it was like the dead man was back. And it was like fucking wrestling's great again, boys. It was like 04, 03, some shit. 03, 04. 03, right after WrestleMania 19. When Brock Lesnar beat Kurt Angle for the Which WWE Which we are going to get on here and discuss, I think, WrestleMania 17. But I was at Grandma's doing a yard sale. So I didn't really have time to watch. And WrestleMania is a long pay-per-view you know i didn't have a chance to watch it yeah it's over uh, three to four hours yeah this was two and a, two and a, two and forty two and a half a little over two and a half hours but back to that like i said like this was when vince kind of monopolized the company and monopolized the industry i mean and aside from tna like they didn't get the recognition they deserved for 19 years wwe has pretty much had it on lock grown as wwe entertainment and this was the first thing we've seen in the wrestling world where it was like this until last year when AEW broke onto the scene with Chris Jericho, like you said, a lot of old stars went to TNA. Same thing. And Tony Khan did a brilliant job with this by bringing Chris Jericho on board because now he just had his 30th anniversary. Dude's a fucking genius, musician, travels the world. The charisma's off the charts. Fellow Long Islander as well. Is he really? Manhasset, Long Island. His father played for the New York Rangers in the 70s as the goalie. I thought Winnipeg, was he born in Canada and then moved here? He was born in Canada, but he lived his first 10 years here in Long Island. Oh, so shit. technically he is, he is considered a Long Islander. He is technically, I think, probably the greatest of all time. And I'll, doubt, I'll explain why. For his age. I'll explain his why age. later. But uh, let's jump into it because we set off this pay-per-view with opener is... JR said, the future of sports entertainment. And I wonder if he ever realized that he'd be involved nearly 20 years later still. And JR, it's the future of sports entertainment still, but you're working with a new company, AEW. And uh, I mean, oh my God, let me tell you something. It's a slob and that, that, That's just how we open the segment. But then we go to Edge and Christian to set it off versus the Coalition, the Canadians. Uh, I'd say yeah, it was Lance an intense Storm match. Mike Awesome. Yeah, yeah, Mike Awesome. I'd say it was an intense match, but I mean, you know, uh, Edge and Christian and Storm are no joke. Mike Awesome is good, but he didn't really last on the scene that long. Mike Awesome was a ECW star. Okay. He should have never left ECW. He was known as one of the greatest ECW champions next to Johnny Grunge. I have. So it, he, is, he is one of the best ECW champions. I, I love how, actually, Christian with the spear, it was a power bomb, and then yes, Christian, Christian with the spear. the spear. And I was like, Christian holy shit, bro, it's Edge. And I was like, brotherly love, the brood, bro, stand together. Yep. <laughs> um. Our second match, I was not a fan of. We had the referee from WCW. We had Nick Patrick versus, versus Earl Hebner. Corny as shit, bro. Tenure. Corny as shit. But um, I honestly felt like the Iron Sheik and fucking Nikola Kola fucking created this match because it was just a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, I've done professional however, wrestling. Was, yo, you, did you see Earl Hebner's spears, dude? It was like a shoulder charge. Like he was Bobby Boucher. It uh, was a flying shoulder But you got to think, yeah. how old was Earl Hebner when he had this match? And you got to give the dude credit no. just for doing it. You know? Well, hold on. Now, here's a conspiracy I'm going to throw in there. Remember, Earl Hebner had a brother. I had no idea. And both of them were referee. Both of them were referees for the WWE. Okay. So, it, it, both of them used to do what the Bella Twins do now is called Twin Magic. Roll in and out. So if, yeah, roll in and out. 
So how do we know that was Earl and not his brother? You're right. Because they're twins. They look identical. Well, here, here's why I thought it was corny, because you got two referees wrestling each other. When refs are, no offense. And it ends up turning into a lumberjack match. Refs are super pussies, bro. They get smacked in the face and they're laid out for 10 fucking minutes. The, you, you do a they're fucking done. move to them in the game and they're out for like 20 years. You hit them with a chair and they're like, I'm going <laughs> to lay here for 10 years. So, I mean, refs are pussies. And I mean, you're slapped and you're laid out, bro. Like, what, what are you doing? So, the best part, what I thought, the way how they ended the match, because it sucks so bad, is that Mick Foley had to come down and... Tell the WCW referees to get out of there once they started beating up Earl Hebner. And then at the end, Earl Hebner hits Nick Patrick with the shoulder tackle and then pins him. And then at the end, Mick Foley pulls out Mr. Sacco and puts it down WCW's throat. Yeah. I think that was the best way to, to end that because it, it was horrible. I think Mick this Foley... The pay-per-view was garbage in, my, in, in general. No, no, no. I, I disagree because Mick Foley for the ref, I was dead. And, you know, like, it was kind of corny shit, but, like, with that weird-ass clothesline spear, like, it was bowling shoe ugly, as JR called the match. He literally quoted, that was bowling shoe ugly. I don't know if it was the spear or the match or whatever, but it was it's one like or the other. like putting lipstick on a pig and telling it to go dance. And then when Oral Hebner got out the ring, dude, no offense to the LGBT community, I'm going to get a lot of smoke for this, but it looked like they were having a gay sauna celebration holding up the ref, holding up Earl, like, they were trying to hold him up. And it looked like, oh, we're all sweaty old men. Like, <laughs> like whatever. It, 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 exactly what happened when Triple H broke his quadriceps I mean, and both the referees I mean, are dragging I mean, him up the ramp. I mean, yo, Mick Foley was giving Nick the dirty laundry when he pulled out Sacco, man. He was letting that shit all air out. <laughs> Mr. Sacco is a, uh, let me tell you something. The guy who spends eight hours in a wrestling ring and jumping around all day, you know he's keeping that sock ready for whoever's going down its throat. Yo, the, the, the attendance, <laughs> after we after we came back from break from that match, it was like 17,964 in attendance, whether it's bullshit or whatever. It was Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I mean, they had DDP calling out Austin, which is epic because I feel that could have been a super feud in itself. You know what I mean? Like you DDP had versus pretty Austin. much the upstar of WCW versus the mainstay of WWE. Hundred percent. That match, that match, I can get behind. I think that would have been a rivalry that would have went places. You got the Diamond Cutter versus the Stone Cold Stunner. Who's gonna win? Who's gonna take it? You know, and I don't know, man. But uh, that's just my opinion. We we move on. We had O'Hare and Palumbo versus the APA. I initially had O'Hare and Palumbo for this match because, I, from what I remember, I thought the it's WCW huge. was dominating this. But apparently, it was yes, the WWE the, started with a squash. Mention, this was tag team champions versus tag team champions. Well, I mean, the APA were the WWF tag team champions. Aside from APA, I mean, like, fuck the other two. I know they're super talented, like Chuck Palumbo came into this thing. But, like, I don't care. It's nothing to be obsessed with. I fuck with APA. Like, Bradshaw was always dope. Ron Simmons, damn! Like, I fucked with the APA heavy. Damn. They always had their cigars, their card games going. APA took the W on that. I'm happy to see them take the W on that. I think they should have took all the day. W on that. Uh, all day. Then we moved to X Pac and Billy Kidman. I had Billy Kidman predicted out the jump because I, 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 like I said, I remember it being WCW squash and WWE. So I thought WCW was going to take the early rounds. It wound up flipping. But Billy Kidman was one of my favorite in WCW, mostly because he had Tori Wilson's sexy ass fucking everywhere he went. Oh, but I mean, the only professional wrestler to ever say that he slept with Tori Wilson <laughs> and still says it to this day. And and it's a fact because as 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 old Big as fact. he's looking now, she's still looking bad as fuck. He could have he's the pop dude, belly. He's a backstage producer. Yeah, in I WWE. know. I, I've seen him. Promos. I've seen him, but uh. I mean, this was epic because at the time it was two guys from two companies, first time working together. I mean, you have X Pac and Billy Kidman, both amazing, like acrobatic athletes, you know, that could do. I mean, you had the double X factor thrown in there. Kidman counter from a power bomb into like an X factor almost, then high flying into a counter X factor into X Pac. The Bronco fail into the shooting star press. And I mean, yeah, the nut check going into the Bronco bus, yo, uh, going into the Bronco bus. And that was like, and I, like I said, Billy Kimmel was one of my favorite because plus Tori Wilson. Oh, Lord. I remember when I had her playboy, me and my cousin's Estro. 
Estro and me, I had a spy case, bro, suitcase, and the and the the thing was the password was six one nine one oh one. Obviously, Rey Mysterio, John Cena, word life. And this is going back to O three, O four. I think it was O three. I had Tori Wilson's Playboy I bought from Castro and his dad. And I wound up trading that to him with another ten dollars. I had to save up lunch money for a week to upgrade to the Tory and Sabil issue, March two thousand and four. Oh Lord. And just to see them laying there like, oh, the boobies. Like I was, I was Jerry the King Lawler at 13. You know what I mean? Like, puppies! Oh, you know, like fucking <laughs> every boy's dream. Like I got a playboy, got a spy case, lock this shit up. They never going to guess the codes. Not my birthday. <laughs> but uh, hold on. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to pause here. We're going to take a segue to introduce you to our sponsors of today's show. And it is not really, but we're going to give a promo to El Segundo Brewing Company for a, uh, Steve Austin's Broken Skull IPA. This is a hell of a goddamn beer. And if you need to drink a goddamn beer, you go get yourself some of Stone Cold's personal Broken Skull IPA brewed in front of the finest brewers with some of the finest hops. Got a great taste. And give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. And don't forget to miss Broken Skull Sessions on WWENetwork.com. Be sure to check out Broken Skull Sessions. Check out my man Time Warp on his new podcast, Our Time Is Now. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. On point, like the old days, I'm starting to lose it. But back in the day, my vocal cords changed. I used to have that shit. And Macho Man, the... Oh yeah, you need a little excitement. Step into a slim gym. Ooh, Miss Elizabeth. Ooh, I can't do it no more, bro. My vocal cords. A lot of smoking oh, cigarettes. Let me tell you something, there, Timey. Let me tell you about I, I what curiosity killed the cat. That, <sighs> that you are the cream of the crop, the coat of the clem. You are everything. Oh uh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Working on it, bro. Oh, you're going to snap into a Slim Jim. Oh, Working man. on it, man. Catch me in Spider-Man. I play bone saw. I'm like, oh. Hey, Spidey, come down here. Let me <laughs> let me sling some webs to your woman, Mary Jean. I'm going to smoke some Mary later. Oh, yeah. But, uh, fucking Raven and William Regal is next on the card. And to be honest, bro. This is the ECW now. I always hated William Regal. Not going to lie. Always hated him. It's changing when it comes to the brands. So now we got ECW versus WWF. And what really didn't surprise me in this match, even though Raven won. Yeah. How come there was no weapons? Yo, why didn't William Regal bring the fucking brass knucks? He keeps tacked in his balls. I, I, I don't understand. You know, like Raven always comes out with a shopping cart full of shit. Or a, 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 a fuck, Reaver, or the garbage can at least. Much. Yeah. Garbage can full of always. fucking plywood. Yo, here's the thing though. I've always hated William Regal, but his book was great. I don't know if you ever read it. I do not remember what the title is called, but I read his book. I bought it on Kindle and I read that shit. And aside from hating him, Excuse me. In the ring and doing his whole gimmick, it was the book was enlightening because it taught him about his his earlier years and how he built a wrestling ring in his backyard with like plywood and bed sheets and shit, and that's how he practiced. So he hustled his ass off to get to where he was. He grinded, and it just gave me a respect for the man outside the business because we see people on the screen and you tend to hate him, but then you love him behind the scenes. Like I hate John Cena because he's a goody goody. He just wrote a child's book. He signed it. And I seen the ad pop up on Facebook, and I'm like, man, I always hated this guy on TV, except when he was Thugonomics. I loved him. But later on, as he became more kid-friendly, I was like, I always hated him, but this guy is a fucking genuine golden dude. They do not cut them from the same cloth as that man anymore, you know? What the company did with John Cena, they turned him into the modern-day Hulk Hogan. But he's a very good businessman, and he does it because he genuinely wants to do it, though, bro. Like, it's not because, like the industry told him to do it. It was because he said, yeah, I'm going to be successful doing this, but I want to do it. Like make a wish record setter for make a wish foundation over 500 something. Make a wishes. Last time I checked probably a thousand in every WWE event. And I've been to five in the past three years. There is always a let's go. Cena Cena sucks. Chan, even when he's not there. Because you love to hate him. Bro. Okay. You uh, hate him. I love him. He is what I, I got to see him at the hall of fame. 
where, you know, he got the induction, you know, where he inducted the kid for the, you know, for the cancer or whatnot. Uh-huh. I, I, got, I got to see him for that. And for the first 10, 15 minutes when he came out, we were chanting, let's go Cena. Cena sucks for the entire time yeah. that he was out. And he, and, and he sat there and he ate it up and he loved it because that's the energy that, yes, in professional wrestling, he is known as we want him to turn heel. We want him to be the bad guy again. But I love when he did that return standard, of Thugonomics for whatever he did when he came in, out. Against Elias. That was great. That was hilarious. That was great. Hilarious. But I, when he returned it for The Rock in 11, I wasn't too happy about it for the fact that he was, was the rock. so rusty. Yeah. No, he was rusty. Yeah. It took him, and if you it, watch it live. Well, Cena was rusty. Cena. Cena. Yeah. Yeah, Cena uh, thrashing on the rock. Mm -hmm. It's a live Monday Night Raw thing. Look it up, and you see how rusty he is. Yeah. The first five minutes of his promo, he sucks, 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 sucks. And at the end, he ramps it up and gets better. It, so it was a return it, to amazing. something that he probably might have not wanted to did, but he went it's, through it's with not, it. It's it's a character that he has pushed to have come back. But Stephanie and the other writers and plus Vince McMahon. They should because hip hop is bag. now the biggest, like culturally, it's it the is, biggest genre, you know, so they should bring it back. But it is, but in, in, in their eyes, they're trying to push culture and diversity. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You know, but it is diverse. Watch Vince's, you know, watch Vince McMahon in Beyond the Map. He says it perfectly. We make movies. Yeah. So you're not, you know, that, that, well, that's in, what he always wanted to do is separate the eyes, entertainment. It's not wrestling. It's a thirty, you know, it's a two to three hour movie that you get to watch for yeah, free. Pretty much. So, you know, so the only people who take it seriously now, in my opinion, because I've stopped watching WWE over the past couple of months, I watch all the internet. Stuff, I, I'm on AEW on kick, everything. bro. I cannot lie. AEW. They are crushing it. And here's what I love, and I wanted to do this podcast months ago, bro, but I had so many scheduled up, and I didn't know if I was going to do two, break them up, whatever, but AEW actually was the first ones who had the actual talent come out during this COVID and support their peers and colleagues by cheering. WWE just had the announcers in an empty arena. And I said, mm -hmm. well, I get it. You're, you're, you're worried about spreading it, but you're all in the same place at the same time anyway. So you're, you're sharing locker rooms, whatever. Like you're going to get it t traveling with each other. So if you're going to get it, you're going to get it. But they actually had like Billy Gunn and everybody like, yeah, like cheering in the crowd, D Dino Boy and yep, shit. They had, and Jungle they had Boy. wrestlers as the audience. And it, it, it made the real effects. And it was cool. Then WWE did the same thing, but then they put the plexiglass up around to be extra safe. And then they went from mm -hmm. that to the TV screens, which I think is stupid as fuck because it's like digital. Like, oh, well, I'm not really here. No, hit your weed, bro. I'm fine. I want I to talk about that only for the fact that WWE had to buy that building and turn it into the stadium. That's not the NXT building that they've been doing all the previous shows out of. Aha. That's called the Thunderdome. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They built their own stadium that is strictly, <clears throat> and I mean strictly, <clears throat> for digital shows. So if you have the top Fuck tier that. membership of, exactly. So if you have the top tier membership on the WWE Network, you get to be that on. That allows there. you to become a fan, and your face gets to be plastered Bro, I, on a. I got the nine ninety nine subscription. They got another subscription on there now. That's cool, but that ain't the same thing, bro. I still fuck with AEW because they're still keeping their talent out there and there's nothing like a real person to fill a void where a real person should be. As far as I'm concerned, they should have everybody out there. Managers, tech crew, if you're not on at that point and you're taking a break and you're rotating with Mark who's in the video truck, get the other video guy out there who doesn't need to be there at the moment. Fill it. With staff, exactly. employees, managers, so we can hear the real chance, the real... I don't want to see some digital shit, bro. I do Zoom meetings for work, and you know how much this sucks? In the morning, getting up, having my coffee, <laughs> like, hey, we could be sitting around our conference room desk and all associating and joking with each other, but, like, that shit sucks, bro. Uh, hey, and I get it. They're trying I to be innovative. Right it's just 
doing it. They're a publicly traded company. They're innovative. I get it. But AEW, I think, is just shitting on them with fan interaction. Plus the way it used to be, like PG show. Like this is the show of for people who grew up watching TV 14 WWE, like the Attitude Era. This is now for you. And they can do their PG thing. Keep it to the kids, which I got nothing hate against. But I take it as Kevin Nash saying the greatest line ever in a shoot with uh, one of the things on YouTube. And he said, I cannot take a guy serious, a grown man serious. This is paraphrased, but very similar to what he said. Is I cannot take a grown man serious just standing there in the ring like I'm gonna kick your butt. Like it's not real I to know me. The interview that you're talking about. But then you go to the bus stop. Then you go to the bus stop commentary. and you got someone like, well, I fucked your mother or some shit. And like, like, bro, in third grade I had a Playboy. You know what I mean? Like third, fourth grade I had Castro's dad. I was over there like watching him at his house. Like <laughs> we we had internet where we had to print pictures off of PinkWorld.com or some shit, bro. We didn't have Pornhub. We had America Online, <laughs> porn pictures, print this before mom and dad gets home, erase my history, you know? So kids know they what it is. Dad. Like, you don't need to shelter them in this safe environment, safe space. Like, no. you got to learn to live and learn to grow as a human for what you're going to be faced with later in life. Your parents' job is to tell you what's right and wrong. So, like... That's 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 how I look at it is kids are going to know, bro. They learn from their peers in school. Like we don't know what other kids go through at home, you know? So I mean Castro's dad was a city cop. He had Playboys. They sat next to the toilet. We viewed Playboys. That's what the fuck we did. So kids got porn hubs found, and they all got computers found, in their hands. Now I they're seeing bitches shoving porno. brushes into the places unknown getting fisted and shit. And we're over here like, "Well, we can't say kick your ass on TV because fuck out." Yeah, I, I told you I met I met Nash, right? I met Kevin Nash, bro. I got to meet Kevin Nash once. I had to pick him up at an airport for a wrestling event. Yo, coolest motherfucker ever, bro. It's in Elmira. Hockey. I think Nash. they just opened. I think they just started doing hockey again, but he gets in the ring. He's like, they stopped selling beer. They don't got their liquor license talking shit. But I met him before the show and uh, sat down at the table with him. I had just broken my hand for the second time in my job. So I just got the pin taken out and I drew a picture with uh, uh, uh I drew a picture of him for him to sign, but it came out like shit, bro. It doesn't look nothing like him. But I had a, <laughs> I had my pinky like this all fucked up when I drew it. And uh, he signed it, sat down with him. I was like, yo, how's Scott? And he goes, yo, Scott's good. You know, this, that, third, like just smokes now. Don't drink. And I'm like, hey, man, that's cool. Like, I was like, he was a major influence for me to try to get sober. I said, this is my first sober event. That was the first wrestling event that I went to sober. And I've been to a lot of WWE events in Binghamton, you know, Nassau Coliseum, MSG over the years. And I said, it's my first sober now, event. I feel weird. Scott Hall? I wish. That's my, that's my, dude, you see the razor curl? Yo, razor. But nah, but, uh, so I was talking to him about that. And, um, he goes, we, you know, I, I, he goes, you know, he's cool, whatever. Give him the little wolf pack thing, take a photo, go to the next thing. And I I, I bought uh, second row seats, me and my mom. I, I took my mom and uh, we're sitting there and all of a sudden, like he starts to get up now and he's about to go backstage and you know how they do it in the, in the small arena. So he's walking past and I was videotaping. I was like, yo, now that's what I wanted, bro. I wanted to see your height, like sitting in the chair is cool, but like, I wanted to see your height. Like I'm a, I'm a tall Viking. I'm six foot two, six, some shit, six, one, six, two, whatever, three, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, I want to see your height. So a dude was like, I'll take your picture. And I like stood next to him. He had his little bottle of wine. He was going back to sip his little wine. And he, yo, dude, he put Big his hand, like, he put his hand, like, all right, put his hand, like right on the back of my neck, like choke slam, like this, bro. And his hand like wrapped around hand like dude. half my neck. And I was just like, I was standing next Big. to him and I'm like, there's not too many dudes that can make me look short. But Kevin Nash can make me look short. <laughs> and let me tell you, dude, as much heat as he gets in the industry for being the way he did, he did what was best for business, best for his family, did everything he had to do. That dude is the most chillest, down-to-earth human being. If you respect somebody, they will respect you back, and that is bottom line. And for me to go there and tell him, like, yo, this is my first solar event, do that, do that, chill. And then I, even though I already paid for the meet and greet, for him to do this, like, little extra thing outside of the money that they always say he was greedy for... Mm -hmm. And we say, oh, yeah. well, I, I just walked up. Yo, that's what I want. The height. All right, let's take another pic. Stand next to me then. What's up? You know, like that was stand up shit. Scott Steiner. I saw Big Papa Pump. I saw Sabu. 
I never got to meet Sabu. I was supposed to go to an event where he was there. Papa Pump, Papa Pump was definitely hitting out. on my mom. Papa Pump like came down the ring. I was like, he gave me a pound it Scott like when he's coming. Weird. Down. It's not weird. Scott it's big. It's a, fucking he, Scott no, Steiner. He, he's a weird. He's a weird person. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. He's a genetic weird person freak. in real life. His he's charisma, weird. charisma was insane. Always on the mic, and also though, but like I said, he saw my mom there, and it was like me and my mom. He knows that it's not my girlfriend. She's clearly older, probably around his age. And he was just like, "Hey, what's up, doll?" Like he gave her like a dap, and I got it on video, and I was like, "Yeah, mom, you just got big pop <laughs> pump dap up." <laughs> Like, maybe you didn't say doll, but it was something like that. Like, hey, babe, hey, sweetie, something like that. You know, like, oh, you hitting on my mom, you fucked her. I got to put you in the Steiner recliner, put your ass to sleep. <laughs> but nah, fuck it. They were all cool dudes. And these are legends who set the, the who paved the way, dude. You know what I mean? And a lot, they both get a bad rep in the industry. The Steiners, oh, yeah. people, bu they bullied me. Well, you're a fucking grown man he, wrestler. You're going to let another wrestler belly, bully you? He pushes steroids on you. Yeah, you know, he wants you to conform to his life. Here's the deal, dude. Here's the, the deal. I'm a wrestler. I'm, I'm. You're not going to force me to do anything I want because I'm a grown man. Okay, you're going to kick the shit out of me. You're going to beat my ass. Good luck trying. You throw two lions in a fucking cage. It don't matter, bro. Who's going to walk out? Simba I, or fucking Scar? I, you don't know. I, well, hold you, on. you might Being kick my ass, but I ain't going back down. Being in the professional wrestling business, there is a code of etiquette that the rookies do have to do certain things that the veterans ask them to I'm do. I'm not going to do steroids because you tell me to do it. A snort coke no, 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 no. though. Whatever. Not as peer pressure or stuff like that, but, you know, like getting their bags from the fucking airlines or the bus. Yes. Like, stuff yeah, like that. hazing shit, you know, bro. Like, college shit. I get bro, that. I get that. That's me, everywhere. I, I'm going I'm, I'm to tell you a fucked up story, which is going to lead us back into the pay-per-view. Because it does involve a couple of the guys. It was Kevin Nash, Scott Scott Hall, and X Pac, and they were in the bar. On the side, on the other end of the bar. Now this is back in pre pre WCW days. I, uh, you know, back when the whole NWO was big. This was back in the early nineties. The Smoking Guns and. Or was it a road dog who at the time was Jeff Billy, Jarrett's Billy Gunn. the roadie? Yeah. They were at the other end of the bar having drinks. So since Kevin Nash, X-Pac, and Scott Hall, they were the click. So they were the veterans. They were sending them drinks. So back then, the rookies had to send them back drinks. Of course. And then the rookies had to pay for it. So they would send them uh, shots of Jack, and they would have to send them back shots of Jack. Finally, a half hour into the whole drinking and everything, because they must have did like four or five rounds, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall tip the waitress like $100 and tell, and, and tell her every time they send us our drinks, you just give us Diet Coke and water. To make it, to make it look Get like- these motherfuckers drunk, but that vodka. was the ribbon shit, bro. Yeah. That's cool, so though. That they, and that I'm not worried so about. Fucking with you, that wise, you got to do. That's but cool. But we did that shit, bro, in high school. I made Rob Casadente yeah. sit on a fucking milk carton on his brand new Islanders hoodie. You know what he did? He got up and threw the shit out. <laughs> and he's like, my mom paid 80 bucks for that, bro. And now I feel guilty. So what did my bitch ass do? I go, you're my best friend. I go in, take it out the trash for you. And everybody thinks I'm a garbage picker. But you know what? I don't give a fuck what any of these motherfuckers think because they ain't going to be around in 15, 20 years. He still is to this day one of my best friends. And Thank I God. went in and said, I felt bad I did that. But it was funny as shit. Make you sit on milk in front of the whole cafeteria. Ha ha. Me, Phil Francavilla laughing at his bitch ass. Like, yeah. <laughs> like me and Phil are laughing, bro. Rob went. He got a tray. We took a chocolate milk, put it underneath his hoodie. This motherfucker came, sat down, <laughs> starts eating his mozzarella sticks, whatever it is. <laughs> me and Phil just laughing. <laughs> Phil's face is turning red. Rob's like, what, guys? What's, what's so fucking funny? Why are you guys laughing so? You fucking assholes. He just slammed his fucking hands down, stood up, lifted his hoodie up, bro, and there was a chocolate milk crushed under his hoodie. His ass was getting wet. He's like, you guys are assholes. Threw his fucking hoodie out, bro. I felt so bad I had to get it. Oh, oh. 
Oh, the poor kid. I was like, I'll wash it for you. But you know how the fucking funny kid. that was in the moment, bro? Middle school, eighth grade. What are you, 13, 14, 15 years old? Testosterone just pumping like, I'm going to roast this motherfucker. That stuff is cool, bro. Ribbing like that is cool. Yeah. But you're not going to threaten funny. me to do drugs or shoot up or buy shit oh, no. from you because I'll fuck you up. And if I get fucked up, oh, well. A lot of the guys who do the steroids, they're just a bunch of talk because they lost their ability to actually throw their hands and actually really fucking defend themselves That's a it. long time ago. Bro, but Scott, you know, Scott I'm not going to lie, though. Once Steiner, you, Steiner was funny as this, shit. That's it. Steiner was funny as shit. He, he, he faces like little nerdy lunch. guy, bro. They brought it through the crowd and then like he kicked him in the balls at one point and the, he's like, ref, I got it on video. Ref, he kicked me in the balls. Kick me in the balls, ref. <laughs> but yo, he put him in the Steiner recliner yeah, for the one, two, three. Beetlejuice that did that to him? I wish, I wish, what happened? Wasn't that Beetlejuice that did that to him? I don't know. I, 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 when Nash came out, Nash had just had the knee surgery. So he was there more for appearance, appearance, because he couldn't wrestle. Yeah, because he wish. I wish I could have seen a couple of those big boots and those fucking knees in the turnbuckle, those heavy knees. But uh, he came out, like I said, he chilled, he was hanging out, and it was just there. To see him, to hear the NWO music play, bro, and I'm right here by the barricade, second row, and just see him walk, it was like, I could never afford these seats if it was WCW or WWF back in the day, but just seeing it now makes up for my childhood. Giving a pound to Big I, Papa I to Pump as he Hart comes down, person. you know? I got to meet Bret Hart in person right here in Long Island. Oh, I yeah, about Bret five Hart's minutes cool. away from my house. I met Kane at got, Nassau Coliseum in third grade, and I got a picture of him shaking my hand, and my hand is like taken over by his hand because in third grade, my hand was like this big. He's like shaking now, my hand. Was that Kane masked, masked. or Kane no mask? Masked. Kane. Oh, okay. Yeah, bro. I'm talking third grade. I was 97. Oh, 90, third grade. That's the 90s. 98, That's 99, 90s. some shit, you know, like yeah. third grade. So, like, but, um, yo. Speaking of Kane, bro, we're gonna we're gonna well actually we're gonna move into this uh six man tag. Big show Billy Gunn versus uh Albert versus Sean Stasiak, Chris Canyon, and Hugh Morris, who are three athletes I could really care less about. Hugh Morris, I did watch WCW like on the network Hugh and he, Morris he's funny. He used to be the WWE trainer. His real name is Bill DeMott. I like oh it is, okay, because I like the name Hugh Morris, yeah, like it's Bill humorous. DeMott, and in WCW, he was known as Hugh Direction. Well, he's probably one of the only ones I care about on that team, and I thought WCW was going to win because it was a squash, and apparently I was right. It was a stolen victory. They did win. Yep. I forget what happened, but they did win. Sean Stasiak hits, uh, Sean Stasiak hits Billy Gunn with the inverted DDT, and Hugh Morris <laughs> picks up the pen. This guy knows, bro. I was watching it like when I was like <laughs> 2 in the morning, bro. I'm watching it, and I'm like, let me just take notes. Let me take notes. But uh, so the, the inaugural match, ball. I'm a little. So here we I, bring no, it. Hold on, hold on. We got another match. I I, I don't want to leave this guy out. He's actually in my family tree. Wait, who? The next match. The next match is Taz from ECW. Oh shit! No, we have a couple. Tajiri. Yo, we have a lot more matches. My fault. I put away the other. Uh, you're right. Taz versus Tajiri. I had Taz picked. Tajiri wins. Poison yeah, it's, mist. It's funny thing. <laughs> Taz, he has his own podcast. I watch it. Yeah, I do too. He 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 is my uncle on my brother's side of the family. No to, shit. To family tree. Yes. My favorite I got to podcast meet him five times. is Raven, even though he hasn't done it in a while. It used to be my favorite wrestling podcast, but Taz is on your relation, huh? Yep. That's crazy. Taz is 6'6", six, six, and he's 230 pounds. That dude Brian Cage and is working with is an animal, dude. Animal. animal like dave batista animal. prime animal yeah and he and dave was big back in the day he's i see dave now big. he's still in great shape but i mean like when you look at dave like when he was just the animal batista like back yeah, in the day the roll the shoulders the leviathan when he came out and did the, like oh what the fuck yeah he but was huge so yeah, he slimmed down a lot I'm, I'm very happy you brought that up and i didn't skip to the next one because after that match it's was... It's 420 break right now because we got RVD. <laughs> versus Jeff versus Hardy. Jeff Hardy. Who, very rare Hardy to see Jeff title. Hardy as a hardcore champion, bro. I was like, what Very rare. Fuck? But that, yo, that, that match, let me tell you, that match was super intense. I mean, both insane athletes. Jeff Hardy and Rob Van Dam, what more? That would have been a rivalry to go down in ages. Not just a pay-per-view, uh, bro. 
The high flying, the dips, the dives, the rolling, matches. the ladders, the chairs, the tables, the everything. I don't know why they never they made that happen. The, they fought for the Intercontinental title. They fought for the hardcore title. They've also fought for the tag team titles while uh, Matt and Jeff were in the last stages of the Hardy Boys and Kane and RVD were going around as the tag team champions on Raw. Okay. I, I, dude, I don't know how the fuck you remember all this shit because without going back to the WWE Network, I'm like, was I smoking weed in fifth grade? I don't remember this shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely was not smoking weed in fifth grade. <laughs> but yo, RVD is uh, actually it, still cool as shit to this day in real life, bro. He's like high stoner dude. Massive like, pothead. He's on fire. Like, I'm he's, waiting. He's I'm really waiting to smoke five time. star Kush or five star frog Kush or some shit. Like, when's your growery coming out, dude? Like, we got to get high, bro. We've been watching you since you were doing the Rolling Thunder fucking days. Let's get the Rolling Thunder OG going. I don't want to fucking smoke an apple with him. You know what I That's mean? Like, he smokes before his wrestling events. He fucking pulls out an apple. He stuffs it. He he's probably like, it. listen, I'm a natural man. I'm going to smoke a little weed, but I'm going to get my vitamins. <laughs> Take a bite of the apple right yeah, after exactly. <laughs> smoking at the bitch. Stem it, stem it out, and you're all good to go. Pack that and go. So fucking... <laughs> Yo, so back to the bra and panties, bro. We have the first ever bra and panty tag matchup. Tori and Stacy versus Trish and Lita. Oh, my God. I had Trish and Lita picked for this one because I just figured WWE girls. I was you like, Tori's the Playboy funny. girl. Well, she wasn't even in Playboy yet. Rewatching but... it. Rewatching it. I really wanted Stacy Keebler to pull through. Now, out of all these women. Oh, I wanted the Tori and Stacey. that I found, even though they're all hot. They're all smoking. The two hottest ones, in my opinion, is Stacey Keebler and Lita. Uh, Lita with that red hair, for some odd reason, that is a massive, very massive crazy. thing. Well, yeah, when I was a kid, like we were stereotyped into like the blondes. And Stacey <clears throat> could just go on and on and on. Yo, when I was a kid, we were stereotyped into the blondes, and I loved the blondes. And Lita was hot, but she always wore like the fucking UFO pants. Aside from her thong hanging out, I was like, yeah, that's cool, but like I need to see legs that's and shit. Hot, you know, and, I love Stacey for that's just legs. Hot. Yo, but to me, Stacy was like why Lita, Lita was rocking the fucking Fred Durst attire the from Limbiscuit before Limbiscuit was even a thing. No, they, nah, not before she was a thing. They, they were still a thing, bro. But she was rocking. No, it. no, the UFO pants. Oh, the U. But I'm saying Biscuit been around all, since '96, dude. The Lim, yeah, but all Limbiscuit's videos. Oh from yeah, the early 2000s. The, the girls. Yeah. Oh, the girls. Well, that's when she was hot. She, she was probably in the rolling music video. Move in. That was probably her. Move in. Move out. The bitches that's rolling, probably. rolling, rolling, rolling. She is one of the. She is the biggest whore in the wrestling business. But she you, has slept with over who? twenty wrestlers. Lita. Yeah. Uh, bro, she's Lita hot. Has, like, I appreciate her much more that I'm older now because I thought she was hot, but like I loved the skimpy revealing shit when I was younger. So like I'm older yeah. now and I'm like, she's hot. She's a MILF. Oh my lord, she's still gorgeous to this day. She's a MILF. Ain't she it? is a MILF. And she does a lot of ASPA a ASPS what is it? ASPCA stuff with the with the animals and I'm like, you melt my heart. Yep. I love you. <laughs> She, she also has a rock band she's in, so she's also touring, doing rock and roll and shit. She's in like a punk band or whatnot. Is she? I gotta check that out. Yeah. But Her real name is Amy Dumas. Amy Dumas. Yeah, no, I know that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yo, when Trish rolls over Tori and rips her pants off, bro, at ten years old, bro, ten years old or however I was at this point, two thousand one, like I was born ninety one. That is watching free softcore porn. This was every boy's wow moment. Bro, is what I, yeah. you know? I mean, like this. What you're right. This was like PG Playboy, dude. I mean, yeah, it's softcore porn that you can watch and wrestle. Bro, before it was huge internet days. I mean, bra and panty matches were like the holy grail of that you got that you could sip and get fed your daily dose of testosterone as a young kid growing up. <laughs> That's the best way to explain it, bro. You get your boobs and your muscle. I mean, hate me or love me for saying it. But I mean, thanks to Tori and Stacy for taking that L because we got our W's. W's for Woody's from that. <laughs> and still to this As day, a young you kid, bro, you get it, when those you will oh bro, a bro. Just they were gorgeous. They had they had amazing like fucking goddess bodies, bro, at that point. <clears throat> 
And I mean, Tori was always a fitness model, but she was always my favorite and shit. Like I said, the Playboys, how much lunch money I had to save to get those things. And <laughs> they were just fucking all amazing. But Stacy, like those legs, bro, I was always a legs guy. I just wrapped those legs around me and she drove me crazy with those yeah. chicken legs. And when she was like in the, in the promo, she's like, and Tori, I got legs from here all the way up to here. And I was like, well, what are you going to do with those legs? I'm just being a man. You know, I, hate me later. <laughs> I, I got to see her be inducted into the Hall of Fame. I, I, her inducting Tori Wilson into the Hall of Fame oh, yeah? at the Barclays Center a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was oh, there. No. Oh, so. so for her to come out, now Barclays Center can hold 30,000 people at a wrestling event. Probably about 22,000 were there. Let's say about a quarter of them were children. A quarter of them were women. 50% are men over the age of 25 and know who all these wrestlers are. Oh, yeah. Stacy Keebler comes out to induct Trish Stratus, uh, not Trish Stratus, Tori Wilson into the Hall of Fame. And when she comes out, you heard air horns. You heard whistling. You heard legs, legs, legs. Cat calls, yeah, all that that's shit. that's all you heard around the entire arena. And when she started talking, everybody started shouting, lift up your dress, lift up your dress. Because she was wearing this. She's got dress. legs. She knows how to use them. Now just show she them to us. <laughs> she had this dress that went down and followed about six to eight inches behind her. And we're all chanting, lift up your dress so we can look at the legs. Damn right, bro. And, that's how I would be, too. And, to this day, she still looks hot as hell. Bro, she, she's a mom now, and I see her on Instagram, and I'm like, oh, Lord. Oh, Lordy, girl, you is fine. <laughs> like, hey, listen, I know you were hot as shit, and you had guys throwing at you back in the day, throwing themselves at you, but, like, now that you're older and you probably don't have a lot of guys throwing at you, like, can I make up for, like, the little 13-year-old horn dog boy that I was growing up? <laughs> I like MILFs. I love MILFs. Your mom, that's cool. We, I, I want to be a dad. Like, what's up? <laughs> you know, I, I always had this fascination when I was, you know, when I was to make it big into the WWE, I would get to meet some of the women that I've, I've always, you know, always had to fantasize about. And one of them was Mickey James. And still to this day, still even hot. though she's 44, oh, she's, she's a mom, a mom oh and God. everything, Bro, she is... Trish Stratus got to be older than her, though. Trish Stratus got to be older Tristratus than her. Stratus is 46, 47. Oh, okay, so they're close and in age, she, but they're both and hot. She, and both, she, both hot and she's still in, in, in good shape. Yeah, all, all, all the old women are. Oh, yeah. All the old women are. You know, Gail Kim. <laughs> Gail Kim even, wrestles yeah. in uh, TNA. And... And, and, you know, like Gail Kim, you know, her breasts are, you know, surgical and stuff, but everything <laughs> else on her are. body is real. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are now, but they're, and, they're all bad. Yeah, no, they still look fucking good as hell. The only girl who looks shit is Sonny. I seen interviews and even now she was very much before my time. Like she was with Shawn Michaels in the earlier days. So like. Early nineties. When she was like twenty two, twenty three, and we were only like She was still cute. She was very cute, and excuse me, and she does like porn now or something, right? Is that right? Is um, she, she she's in jail right now, but is she really? Yeah, for um, I, I for a warrant out for her arrest mm -hmm. for uh, violating probation. I saw her recently on a couple shoot interviews, and and it's weird you say that because I see a lot of people. You know, talk a lot of smack about her. She has a book that I do want to read, and I will read it eventually. But I think from what I saw last, I'm a man, I'm a dog, and like Cactus Jack, I like to bang, bang, and I would probably still smash, tear that shit up like I was Shawn Michaels in 96. If you want my personal opinion, go watch her porno, and then you're going to regret ever saying I'm just fucking around, bro. But I'm saying, I, I, I saw, from what I saw, no, it'll crush all your child injuries. I don't think so. Dude. I don't know. I think, I think I show I what it, it. I think I show what a young bull is about, and she could be the matador, matadoris. If like they add s's in Spanish, I don't know, matadoris, and I will plow through that shit like the bull that I am. I've seen it. It's not good. 
It's not good at all. The only highlight of it is when her boyfriend goes to put it up her ass and she farts. That's the highlight oh, of wow. the second video. Yeah, well, here's the thing, bro, and because it, because China China's sex tape wasn't good either. Like one night in China, like I wasn't a huge Which fan. Which one? Of it. Like her and X Pac, the whole fucking thing. I guess I don't know. The and the first one, the original terrible. one. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, but it was a sex tape, and like, dude, here's the thing: like, sometimes when you're they on were camera, all drugged up, they were on cocaine. Yeah, but I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever tried to like make a sex tape with your girlfriend or anything. But like, when you're on camera, closed. when you're on camera, like, I'm a performer and I love to perform, but on camera, it's weird because like, it's like I'm being watched. So like, it's not in your natural <sighs> habitat. There he goes. But it's not in your natural habitat, you know what I mean? Like, you're not just taking them down because you want to take them down. Your animal instinct is kicking in. Like, when you're taking them down on animal instinct, it's going down. When you got people watching or a camera watching, you're, like, kind of like, am I doing this right? Is everything's got to be perfect? Like, you're under the spotlight now, so it's got to be like, oh, you might fuck up and do some shit wrong. And, oh, I can't change it. And anxiety. But, like, when I'm just smashing that pussy in the bed, bro, bro. We going, but I'm You're on camera. Not not raw, not raw. Like I'm a, I'm a still rap it, but like raw, like in the uh, moment, just go for it. Versus like, oh shit, like go, so, go, there's, go. A, there's a guy with a camera over there taping me. Am I am I good? Is this okay? Like you're thinking too much, bro. And that's not what <laughs> sex is. Sex is animalistic. It's an animal instinct. You don't need the cameras and the shit to be watching. You just go to town, bro. You do you. The pheromones, the. Does it smell good? Am I am I going? All right, I'm getting too much into it now. This is this is not this is PG rated, folks. Not really. It's <laughs> fucking TVMA, but it's closer <laughs> to NC seventeen if you want to call it that way. Dude, my show is explicit thoughts with three X's all the way, bro. Even though I moved away from the EQ and I'm now time warp, I still keep it explicit. I'm still Mister Triple X. And not triple X for sex, but triple X for smoking, drinking, never had sex as a straight edge, like CM Punk. And then I struck out and I smoked, I drank, I had sex. No matter which side you are, back to the binary shit, on my side of the tracks, whether you a perfectly innocent soul or you struck out in life and you sinned all major three sins, we all won, brother. And that's it. That's all I care about. What you smoking over there? Cigarette? Yeah. Gotta quit those shits, B. Gotta quit those shits, man. But yo, those are the replica Fine. belts, huh? Well, if you want to call them that, they're the kid size belts. It don't matter. I have, I have a whole collection. Hey, I it, have... it's a gold one and it's replica, dude. I'm not paying four hundred dollars for something I'm never gonna wear if I could buy the kid's gold replica for two hundred dollars. Like it's gonna put in, it's gonna, it's in a trophy case in my room in my studio. You know, I paid one hundred and sixty for each of these. I have, I have a hundred and fifty dollar one. It's gold plated and it's the, it's the uh, one, the title that Brock Lesnar won, the original WWE title, and like oh three or some shit oh four oh five yeah yeah and it's from niagara falls belt. though because i went to niagara falls with my grandma she got me the tyler w nameplate on there and then it's got the canadian flag where the world is like where the where the world should be it's the canadian flag because it's niagara falls mm -hmm. and dude it's a kid size belt because i bought it when i was like 13 or 14 like i was still a skinny young buck and it I don't care because it's just sitting in a replica thing on my shelf and it's memorabilia, dude. I don't care if it's adult size, kid size. Like, I'm not the WWE champ. Don't make a difference to me. I have over 15 belts. Bro, I remember yeah, back in the day you the had that. Year, you I had that. Collected. You and RJ had the wrist spinner uh, USA title. And we used to wrestle for that shit on the island, bro. We used to have the fucking matches yep. and wrestle each other. Like, who's taking the title home for the weekend? And I had, yo, actually, I had the Canadian belt back then. That was the Canadian one that I had back then, bro. With my nameplate and everybody tried to take it from me. And I, I put, used to put like fucking RJ and Justin in the figure four, make them tap out. And I, I would do it for real, bro. That's probably why I got bad <laughs> knees to this day. God said, you fucked up your friend's knees. I'm going to fuck your knees up. Give me 10 seconds. I got to get my charger. Yeah, go get your joint. I'm, I'm going to see what we going to segue right here right quick. Uh. Inaugural awesome. brawl. The inaugural brawl to end it all. And if anybody is keeping count, the score is WWE 5 oh. and WCW 4. Oh, what is 5? I thought it was the other way around. Okay. 
No, because WCW and W and ECW were together, so their wins tally together. So they go out with okay. So it's five versus four, and that's gonna. I'll be right back before my. Before no doubt, I, bro. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, man. Don't worry about it. Get you get what you need. So we gonna jump into this right here. That was super fast, bro. I was literally like gonna like start talking shit into the camera, and I was like, he's already back. You can talk shit, I don't care. But, uh, yeah, bro. Honestly, so what I was going to say also is that Steve would be considered the GOAT at this point for being the head when two companies collide, right? At this point in time, when two major companies back in the day where it was WCW, NWO, and versus WWE. Well, not really NWO, but WCW versus WWE. Steve was... The pinnacle point at this at this at this uh, stage, right? So, I would hey, say that is again? why he is the goat, is because he was the top superstar when all this shit, when two major companies with all the wrestling stars, legends, past, present, and future are still around today, culminated at this one point. I'd say the only way that he could get picked off his throne is if. Tony Khan was to one day buy WWE or some shit, right? Hypothetical situation. Tony Khan buys WWE. Let's say their stock plummets and they can't afford to do the multi-million, billion dollar uh, around the world. Uh, I know it's never going to happen, but let's, you know, Tony Khan's a billionaire too. You never know. Nobody thought Ted Turner, the billionaire, would ever go out of business either. So you never know. And let's say- yeah, but here's the thing. Ted Turner started in television. He didn't do wrestling his whole life. I know. There, you know, that is. But he was—he was still—he was still a huge—he was still a huge wrestling fan, as Vince would say. Yeah, but being a wrestling fan and living in the business Industry. and with the trends Which are two right. totally different things. Which you're now, right. Tony Khan's family owns fan. the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he's a fan. So he—he's a fan, but the company is ran. By professional wrestlers that have been in it for more than ten to thirty years, they're doing so they're doing the Dusty Rhodes doing, approach. Like Dusty yeah, Rhodes' what, family man, was in, and, and Cody is a brilliant is, no, president. What they're doing is a updated version of Eric Bischoff with Ted Turner. What they're doing is Tony Khan is Ted Turner. Tony Khan writes the check. They can do whatever they want, but Tony Khan actually has say in what goes on with where the money's being spent. So he, he, he he's thing. giving them creative control, which WWE initially they gave and then all took away. Creative control. Yeah. They have all creative control. Tony Khan signs the checks, but he designates where the money goes, how they're doing it, which and the whole nine. I yards. think is great though because which he has confidence. Ted Turner, Ted Turner never did that. Ted Turner just lo loved it so much. He was like. There's a billion dollar check. He, you know, do what you want to do. That's what ran Ted Turner out of business. He, 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 he just, yeah, he was just signing checks as opposed to Khan is actually checks. looking into now, it. He, he's actually asking where but, the fuck but is his money Here's going? the thing is, is WWE dude has become so gimmicky and that's what they tried to get away from initially was they were trying to get away from the, okay, well the superstars and heroes and gimmicks and the chainsaw guy and the clowns and the whatever. So let them be themselves. That's where attitude error kicks in. So AEW is picking up where attitude error left off and attitude error left in the dust because attitude error got back to the gimmicks of who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, whatever, without giving them creative control where AEW is given creative control, so these you're you're he's he's signing the checks, but he's entrusting like guys like Jericho, Cody Rhodes, you know, like the rest of them, like Lance Archer and Jake the Snake and and uh, all these guys to go out there and be able to be like, we know what's best for business, and we're gonna make this happen the way we've always done it, and that's how it should be, as opposed to you telling them what they're scripted, what they gotta say, how they gotta say it, when they gotta say it. Let them go out and work off each other's energy. And kind of do like an improv thing that works best to make each other look good. And I think that's what AEW is doing right. Let me tell you something, baby. This is the dream that they wrote. Let now, me know, I baby. Very, very, very I, I that's pretty very, good. I am very, 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 very happy with, with what my son Cody is doing over there. Cody is doing a fantastic job. Yo, that's uh, awesome. I, I, thank God that he's not wearing no polka dots. 
because if he was wearing them polka dots, he would rock them just like his father would and make a billion dollars out of them. Yo, Dusty, one but, of the greats, rest in peace to Dusty Rhodes, but I'll tell you what, there's nothing that he didn't do in this industry that his sons did not learn from him, obviously. They picked up a lot. He raised two, I raised two hell of a boys. They know the what they're doing. Together. Yo, they know what they're doing, they know how to do it, and this industry is in their fucking blood. Dustin and Cody, both of them, fucking genius, and I don't think, I don't think the company, yeah, they, they have Chris Jericho. And and you know you got you got a lot of other great guys in there like the Young Bucks and I'm not taking away from any of the talent but I'm saying to be led by guys like Chris Jericho obviously who was one of the big spokesperson who came over but to be led by guys like Cody Rhodes and Dusty Rhodes who were it runs in their blood brother I don't think it's gonna get any better than that it's the best guidance you can get they love the industry years when I was younger I used to think Goldust was a weirdo and then as I grew older and I seen him for who he was and the person he was I said this guy is a genius he's been around this long bro we talk about Chris Jericho being around 30 years dude there's not too many dusty roads out there Cody's still fairly new you know but Dustin Cody's been around since 2008 I know but how yeah, long's Cody's Dusty been around hours. Dusty 93 90 90 Dusty, 88 no. I don't know no, Dusty has been around since about, I think, like, 77, 78. He's that old? Yeah, Dusty started in, like, 78. No, 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 I don't mean Dusty. I mean, I mean Dustin, like, Gold Dust. Oh, Dustin? Dustin, yeah, not Dusty. I, I, I call him Dusty because, it's that to me, that's Dusty still now. Like that's He probably started in around 84, 85. I'm saying because he was, he was very, he was, like, 93 WWE, 94 when I was, like, three, five years old. Like, I had a flexi Bendham Gold Dust. And, I mean, he was doing that and probably. Gold Dust came around the time Owen Hart was introduced into the company. I'm saying so he's been around a while. Yeah, when I say when I say Dusty, my fault for the confusion. I mean like not not Dusty Rhodes, the late great, but Dusty. Like I I call him Dusty because it's Junior, like Dustin Rhodes though. But like he's still genius, bro, in everything he does. You know, it, it, there there was a shoot where Dustin talked about something with his father and Vince McMahon and. To what he said that his father told everybody this, whoever he trained, mm -hmm. he would tell them when I first when he told them when I first came into the WWE, they wanted me to wear a diaper. I told them I'll put on that diaper and I'll make a million dollars out of it. Then they turned to me and then they gave me polka dots. And I said, I'll still wear the polka dots and I'll make a million dollars out of it. Cause it was in his heart, bro. That was that ran in his blood. <laughs> He was born for this so, shit. He, 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 when you're given something, you're supposed to run with it. That's it. You don't That's bitch and complain because you. if you bitch and complain and you try to go against the grain. They're just going to sit you down the, and you ain't nope, going to do anything. It's not even that. You go against the grain with sandpaper, it works okay. But when you go with the grain with sandpaper, smooth, baby. Smooth, baby. Well, no, it, it not, 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 not in today. But, but yo. And, uh. I'm starting to run out of space here on my phone and my battery going to die. So let's jump into this inaugural ball. We got DDP, yeah, Booker T. Oh, but but like I was going to say, the the only thing, what, what brings back to the beginning of this conversation is that the only way that, that Stone Cold is never going to go down is the greatest of all time is if, Con, if uh, Con, Tony Khan buys the company and has Jericho be the head of it because that's the next generational merger. Like if he had like Jericho be up there or something, that would be the only way I think Jericho would be the goat over Austin. Well, right now, in my opinion, Chris Jericho is the greatest of all time. Me too. He's been in the be business honest. since he, he's Forever. been in the business since he was eighteen. He's thirty fucking like years, bro, of constant like wrestling and touring and doing music and yeah. But, I, you know, it, I, last last point on Jericho: when you come out to your theme song and your theme song cuts off halfway, and the crowd and the is entire singing, the crowd is singing it. You made it in the business as Hulk Hogan fame. Bro, there's so okay, many. That is Hulk Hogan fame. That is being the top of the wrestling business and nobody else. There's only four people on the Mount Rushmore of wrestling. Hulk Hogan. No, nah, I disagree. Rock, not Hulk Hogan, The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and Jericho. I, I, Jericho I disagree. because of... Now I'm I'm going to list why. I, I have it written yeah. right here, dude. I'm, I'm, we're going to get into it, but hold up. Let's get into the match first. <laughs> Let's get into the match. 
So we got inaugural brawl, DDP, Booker T, Rhino, Dudley Boys versus Stone Cold, Kurt Angle, Jericho, Kane, and Taker. Now, that's every major player. I'd say the only one missing is The Rock from WWE. That is the Attitudes Era best of the best. In my opinion, that is the Mount Rushmore of WWE. Stone Cold, Kurt Angle, Jericho, Kane, and Taker. Add The Rock on there. We got another president's face added on the board. I'd say the only <laughs> one you could subtract at that time period is Jericho because he's only been in for 10 years to replace him with The Rock. But since The Rock's been out for 10 plus years, I'd say add Jericho in. You got Stone Cold, Kurt Angle, Jericho, Kane, and Taker. That's the WWE Mount Rushmore. Uh, everybody's a little debatable. I choose I choose Jericho because he's got the charisma and That's plus it. also he's 100%. still he's and he's still young. doing fucking lion he's, salts and shit. He's young. <laughs> he's young. Uh, the Rock only for the fact that he made his career in professional wrestling and he knew when it was time to stop. You're right, yeah, but 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 still, he I, still could have kept going. He just for. everybody said Rock was a shitty actor, and he wound up keep going with it. But I mean, like. Uh, I, I, hold on. Now he's the pay, highest paid actor in the world. You know what I mean? Like him doing and Tom all the Cruise blockbusters. Are the two most requested actors in Hollywood today? Who? Him and who? Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure Tom Cruise are ain't been around in a while. Two most requested actors well, to up. be in their movie. Yo, we're gonna speed this up. I just want to read the rest of my notes off right quick. So Paul rides Brock's dick, and I get that because that's his major money draw. But one thing about Paul, no denying it, is he put a lot of people on. Paul Heyman from ECW. He bought the best out of his talent and getting everybody, like, just yelling gore at Rhino. He's like, gore, gore, and Rhino comes up, gore, gore. So, I mean, like, he bought the best out of his talent. And, I mean, Brothers of Destruction, they had the rolling, 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 Limb Biscuit for Life yeah. fan, baby. You already know. But, uh, you know, I'm a roll for life. Austin had the disturbed step up theme, which was my favorite. And I mean, we're going to talk about why we thought the pay-per-view failed. I loved it, in my opinion, because DDP and Booker, the reason it got bad backlash was because people said, well, it wasn't the the, the whole uh, WCW and they didn't bring in the greatest stars and they didn't bring this and that and the third. No, they didn't. No, here, here's how I look at it, though. I loved it. And you said it was a fail earlier. But DDP and Booker T were WCW, bro. This wasn't this wasn't uh, you know, WWE you know invasion by NWO. This was WCW invading WWE. You can't have Nash and Hall. They did come later. They did come later. The NWO came later, and I'm glad they did it the way they did it, where they did come later because it extended it. Where Austin met the NWO, but at this time, bro, DDP Booker T, the last WCW champion, bro, these two were top tier WCW, and they pretty much were Without what was doubt. left. We had Kidman. We, we had a, a lot of other people in there. So you did have we top have to talent. Do another video, uh, but I think people, we have to do people, video people, to get into that. Yeah, but people misconstrued. People that. misconstrued, and they said, you know, that the whole roster wasn't there. But aside from Ric Flair, who did come later, become GM, WCW was there. NWO was to come later, and also another segue off of that is that I'm glad they did everything the way they did it. Because I wouldn't have it any other way. Because as much as people complain, you're thankful to have lived it and witnessed it and see the great talents unfold the way they did. And that's what I'm about. It was one of their five most bought pay-per-views in the entire history. And, and dude, I didn't realize this was where Stone Cold traded. You know what I mean? Like, I thought like he no, traded and already came back. Betrayals. But we're going to jump into trials. this. We're going to jump into this again. And we got to do Survivor Series 2001. Because I was like, when the fuck did Austin come back? And it was Survivor Series. Well, I thought he already left and came back and Vince was like, come on, don't hug me. Don't hug me, Steve. I need the old Austin. And then when he did that screw job at the end, I was very mad at you, Steve. I was mad enough that I wanted to crack your beer can and not drink it. I remember I was at my cousin's house. I'm watching Monday Night Raw. I do it. I had a stone cold hat. I threw that shit on the ground. I got up and I stomped that shit out. And my cousins were looking at me. Estro, bro. And he was like, what? And I was like, why are you doing that, bro? You're stepping on your hat. I was like, Stone Cold traded them. Like, I f We didn't even watch the pay-per-view, bro. We didn't afford the pay-per-view. But I saw it on Raw the next day, and I was like, oh, Steve, why? You, you, you want to know what it was? They had to make it a draw because the original plans they did genius for the invasion pay-per-view. Here is what 
here's what the original intentions were. When they did the invasion pay per view, they knew they didn't have all the correct WCW guys. They they knew that, and they rushed the gun on it. What they should have done was they ended it on a tie. WCW tied with five. WWE, so, so we could so, extend so, it so into so ECW down, One Night Stand. Five to five. ECW One Night five Stand coming five. soon. So the ECW One Night Stand didn't happen until 2005. That was four years later. But oh, really? Five years? Yeah. Oh shit. Four years later. Damn. So yo, we're we're, we're gonna wrap it up. One Night Stand. We're gonna wrap it up because I don't want to lose any of this, and my and I gotta shift around memory on my phone. But um, we are gonna do a Survivor Series 2001 pretty soon. We're going to wrap up where Austin betrayed WWE and come back to that. And yeah. this is where we're going to end it right now is that, you know, after DDP hit the diamond cup cutter and, and Taker came in, I don't know if you realized, but he twists his ankle and goes, oh, right. right. Like going in. But like once Charles Robinson got that last ride, I was like, oh, that motherfucker's dead. I was like, if you get bitch slapped and you get knocked the fuck out, you're dead now. But I didn't realize this was, like I said, I didn't realize this was the Austin Screw Show where he goes to WCW. And I, I thought like he already was at WCW and Vince was begging him to come back. But time has been Story so long in the past 20 no years. Storyline-wise, it made no sense. In my point of view, it made no sense. Especially when he came had, back, he it, was already beating him with the, with, the, with the pool cue and stuff. But, yo, we're going to get into it, bro. It, we're going to gonna wrap this here because my phone's going to die. And I want to make sure it saves, buddy. All right. But, yo, we're going to wrap this here. And like I said, yo, we are coming back for the Survivor Series. Yo, we should we should do shoot for next week or some shit. All right. You're, you're yeah, going to be my wrestling guy, bro. Too. TJ, we're going to be hosting a co-host a fucking wrestling podcast. You're going to be my wrestling guy. Salute, brother. Holla at you later. Holla at you later. And holla if you hear me. Holler if you hear me. So you heard it here. Yo, we're going to come back. We're going to be wrapping this up and discussing this on the next WWT Wrestling With Time episode because I don't want my phone to die or run out of memory or whatever the case is. And I didn't really come prepared to go over an hour. And in HD, your gigabytes eat up when you an hour. But yo, shout out to my man. Tree J Roden, aka TJ the Road Star Roden. Thanks for coming through. We're going to discuss Survivor Series 2001, how Austin makes that return from his fall. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Whatever I got left in the can, you heard? Salute. Thanks for tuning in. Come back soon. You heard? Our time is now.